one day, I noticed signs at several different houses that all said something to the effect of, please clean up after your dog. Now, some of them weren't worded quite as politely as that, but the message was the same, please clean up after your dog. And I thought, oh, well, obviously there is a problem with people not doing that, walking their dogs and not picking up after them. And I remember uh, the last time I was in Niagara Falls, being looking out over the falls, being struck by the signs that are on that stone wall. Uh, if, if you look over to see the falls, signs that said, please do not climb on the wall. And I thought, really, like people need to be told not to climb on a wet, slippery wall that's overlooking the gorge where you could plummet to your death. But I guess they do need to be told that. So these signs point out the existence of a problem. Uh, these signs alert us to something that has happened, or that might happen, or that needs attention, uh, that needs to be corrected, or needs to be avoided. And if that problem didn't exist, you wouldn't need the signs. I'd like you to think of our scripture lesson from the Gospel of Matthew in this, uh, in this, with this in mind. It's about dealing with conflict. And um, it's a sign that conflict was a problem in the church back then, in Matthew's day, just as much as it is today. If it wasn't a problem, Jesus would not have had to say anything about it. Matthew is unique among the four Gospels in that he collects Jesus' teachings together in five long sections. The first such, sec such section is the Sermon on the Mount that we're familiar with, and there are four others. Chapter 18 is one of them. And these teaching sections, these five teaching sections, are meant to make us think of the five books of Moses in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the reason for that is that Matthew wants us to think of Jesus as the new teacher, the new lawgiver, the new Moses, the new giver of a way of life. Chapter 18 focuses specifically on the church, on life together in the church. And we get a glimpse of some of the problems that Matthew's church struggled with, and lo and behold, there are many of the same problems and issues that churches struggle with today. The first part of the chapter that we didn't read this morning concerns what it means to be great. Greatness in God's eyes is not the same as greatness in the world's eyes. It seems that Matthew's church confused greatness with having a lot of money, power, influence, or fame. That's not who is great in God's kingdom, Jesus said. If you want to see true greatness, look at this little child. In Jesus' culture, children were the very opposite of greatness. They were vulnerable, powerless, and, de and dependent. They were often ignored and neglected. At the same time, we know that children are innocent and trusting and open. In God's upside-down kingdom, they are the model of greatness. So be like them, Jesus said. And don't neglect them. Jesus said, you will be judged not by how you treat the powerful and important people, but by how you treat the little ones among you. Those who, like children, are often overlooked or neglected because they don't have money, they don't have influence. Woe to anyone, Jesus said, who causes one of these little ones to stumble or fall. Woe to anyone who hurts or ignores or abuses the weak and the vulnerable among you. Every church should ponder this teaching. Who are the little ones in our midst? They may not literally be children, they may not be young in years, but who do we tend to ignore, forget, neglect, overlook, not see, not listen to? Watch out, Jesus says, they may be your great ones. Then the last part of the chapter, chapter 18, is about forgiveness. And who doesn't need to think about forgiveness? In my 40 years of ministry, I would have to say that the number one spiritual issue that most people struggle with the most is forgiveness. They don't know how to forgive, 
They don't know how to be forgiven. They live with a terrible burden of unforgiveness that cripples their relationships and weighs down their hearts and robs them of the joy of living. How to treat the least? How to forgive and be forgiven. These were big issues in Jesus' day. If it weren't, he wouldn't have had so much to say about it. And they continue to be big issues for us today. But I want to turn to the middle part of the chapter that we read from today. And it's about conflict in the church. Now, it occurred to me when I was preparing my sermon, this may not be the best topic to preach about on my very first Sunday with you. But it's what the scriptures gave us, so here we go. Have you ever had a conflict at Westminster United Church? Of course you have. You don't need to tell me, of course you have, because every church has had conflicts. See, we care about our church, we care deeply. And when we care deeply about something, we run into, pe we run into other people who care just as deeply as we do, but they have different ideas about what really matters, and that creates conflict. Our passions and our priorities collide. Jesus knew there would be conflict among his followers. He takes for granted that they will hurt one another and sin against one another. The New Testament has no romanticized ideal of that perfect, idyllic church where everybody always gets along perfectly. Throughout the New Testament, conflict is just assumed. The existence of conflict is just assumed. Now, I find people are sometimes shocked by conflict in churches. I can't believe that this is happening in a church of all places. We're supposed to be Christians, we say. We're better than, aren't we better than this? So conflict makes us sometimes feel like failures. It makes us feel ashamed. But Jesus is clear that his followers are not angels, but human beings with human, all too human imperfections. Blind spots, shortcomings, and emotions that are not always under control. People who think differently and see things differently from us. People who bring their hurts and their hang-ups with them to church. We call the church a family, and for good reason, because conflict is just part of family life. Note that Jesus does not just lay a heavy guilt trip on us to make us feel bad about conflict. He says, look, I know you're going to have conflict. It's unavoidable. It's how you deal with it. It's what you do about it that matters. And Jesus laid out three principles for dealing with conflict. Those principles are honesty, tenacity, and community. First, honesty. The first, step, the first step in dealing with conflict is to be honest about it, to go and talk to the person you're having conflict with directly and openly. Now this sounds so basic uh, and so obvious, and yet it is often not at all what we do. Rather than talking directly to the person we, who, has offended, who has offended us, what do we do? We go to somebody else, right? Instead of talking to that person, we find somebody else to talk to, either to gossip or to complain. Do you know what she said to me? I can't believe what he just did. Now counselors call this emotional strategy triangulation. And uh, this is a picture of triangulation. What we do in triangulation is we create an emotional triangle by bringing somebody else into our conflict rather than dealing it directly. So this picture shows two people in the, church, in the church, person A and person B, who are having a dispute, and they each go to the, one goes to the pastor and tries to get the pastor to intervene and sort it out. So, a very common pattern uh, in the church, but it also happens in all our relationships. And the reason we triangulate like this is because conflict is scary, right? I mean, our physical response to conflict is really a fear response. Our heart beats faster, our, uh, we get shortness of breath and butterflies in the stomach. What if I confront her, we think, and she blows up at me? Even worse, what if I lose control and I blow up at her? What if I say something that I can't take back? And what if by 
going to this person, I make things worse, not better. What if he won't listen to me? Or worse, what if I find out I have to listen to him? And so it seems safer and less threatening to share our conflict with someone else or to recruit somebody else as an ally. It's easier than to face that person directly. But when we do that, you know, we're really saying that we don't respect the other person as an equal. We're saying that we don't trust one another enough to be able to speak and hear the truth with each other. Now, I have to confess, this is one thing I really struggle with. I am a champion triangulator. Like many ministers, I am famously conflict averse. On the fight or flight spectrum, I am truly on the flight end of the spectrum. And maybe you are too. But the thing is, we need to help one another with this. It's part of being a community of Christ. To help one another find the courage to speak the truth in love, as St. Paul puts it. Now, sometimes we speak the truth, but it's not spoken in love. You've heard the expression to be brutally honest. Brutal honesty may contain the truth, but it's never loving because its aim is to hurt and punish and tear down that person who has hurt us. We also struggle with something that Jesus never had to deal with. Namely, that we can communicate very easily without actually ever having to face the person. We can email, we can text, we can post on social media. And it's really a lot easier to let it rip when we're not actually standing in front of the person. I had a, in a former church, I had a very serious conflict, and one of the individuals involved would send out these angry emails, and if you looked at the emails, they were all written around one, and, one or two o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, so he'd get all ramped up, and then he'd just let it fly in the middle of the night, saying things that he would never have said if he was sitting in front of you. We may also think it's more loving to withhold our honesty, but that often doesn't solve the conflict, it just postpones the day of reckoning. The passage of time usually does not make a serious conflict go away. It just pushes it under the surface, where it can fester and grow and erupt at a later time with more destructive impact. Our second reading today from Romans 13 tells us that the whole of God's law can be summed up in one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself can mean a lot of different things, but one of the ways that we put that law into practice is by always striving to speak the truth in love, even in the midst of conflict. So that's the first principle. The second principle is tenacity. Now tenacity means sticking with it not giving up, persisting. Jesus said, if the person you're talking to won't listen, shuts you down, lashes out, walks away, don't just give up, don't cave in, and don't declare war, try again, but this time, take a couple of other people with you. Now, you may be thinking, that sounds a lot like triangulation. <laughs> that sounds a lot like what I was just talking about before, but it's different because Triangulation goes on below the surface and in the background, not out in the open. It may also sound like ganging up. You know, I'm going to bring some heavies with me to, to support me. But the reason for bringing others in is not to do that. It's to provide perspective and wisdom. Jesus is echoing the language of dispute resolution from the Old Testament, which says that you need at least two witnesses to establish the truth of the situation. At the root of most conflicts are differing perceptions of true truth, what's happened, and whose, uh, whose, role is, who, whose role is whose. And often we can't see that bigger picture because we're so emotionally invested in our version of the truth. So bringing others in can clarify what's actually going on. Now, it's a bit risky because while we hope that the other person will see our side, it might turn out that we have to end up seeing their side. We want them to see how they're in the wrong, but chances are we'll have to see how we were in the wrong, so it's risky. But this leads to the third principle of Christian conflict management, which is community. 
you know, we have this idea in our culture that uh, we should basically stay out of each other's business. If two people are in conflict, you know, that's their private concern and has nothing to do with me. And sometimes we really do need to mind our own business. But it's also true that conflicts are often bigger than the individuals involved. And as Christians, we're meant to face life together. We're meant to help one another, to bear one another's burdens, to be responsible to one another. As St. Paul put it, we're like members of a body. If one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. And if that hurt is caused by a conflict, it really affects everybody. Not all conflicts can be resolved by just the people who are directly involved. Being a Christian community means developing the ability to deal with these things together. Jesus says that if a conflict can't be resolved with these steps, you take it to the church, to the whole community. His focus is on the well-being of the community. And one thing he says, it's you know, a little bit hard, but one thing he says that if it turns out that one party is clearly in the wrong, and that person remains stubbornly unrepentant, and if their behavior is wounding the whole church, the time might come when you need to part company with that person. Jesus used pretty harsh language. He said, treat that person as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. And I have to tell you, when I read this, my anxiety level goes, like, way up. Um, because, you know, we never want to do that. We never want to get to that point. I was a minister in a small town. And in this town, there was a very large, very conservative church that practiced basically public shaming. So if someone was caught doing something wrong, usually it was a girl who got pregnant before she was married, or... You know, somebody who cheated a family member out of some money. When somebody did something wrong, they'd have to stand up in front of the whole church, confess their sins, and ask forgiveness before they could be allowed back in. And I always found that idea pretty horrifying, and I don't think we would ever want to interpret Jesus' words in this way. I also know from experience that conflict that is too widely shared can be a minefield. You know, you never know when it's going to blow up in your face. People take sides, uh, the gossip mill goes into overdrive, and a lot of people can get hurt. Having said that, though, there is something deeply true in what Jesus is teaching here. We need to think of the impact of conflicts on the well-being of the whole body, because that body has a mission, and that mission is to carry out Christ's work in the world. And sometimes that may mean deciding what behavior we are willing to tolerate and not tolerate, and what lines we will not cross, because it puts the whole church's mission at risk. At the end of the day, there may be things that are so toxic that they infect the whole body and really need to be dealt with. Every church hopes that will never arise, but if it does, it concerns us all, not just the minister or the board, or the Ministry and Personnel Committee. It's everyone's concern. But this is very much an extreme case, a last resort, not a first resort. Leading up to this point are multiple efforts of truth-telling and multiple, way, multiple attempts, rather, to find reconciliation. Now, at this point, Jesus says something that I've always found a little bit puzzling. He says, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. This sounds kind of like Jesus is giving the church the power to decide who's in and who's out. The power to decide who's forgiven and who's condemned. And that's kind of scary. Because elsewhere, Jesus clearly says that forgiving sins is God's business and God's alone. So what's he really saying here? Well, I think Jesus is saying, at the bottom of this, at the root of this, Jesus is saying that how we treat one another is a matter of eternal importance. It's not insignificant. It's a matter of eternal importance. How we behave towards one another is the concrete way in which we show the presence of God's kingdom here and now. It's the way that we demonstrate 
that we're following Jesus through our words and, and actions. And it's the example that we set for those outside the church that represents Christ to them. Often the church is seen very negatively because of the way that we fail to handle conflict well. We need to set an example of how to settle differences in such a way that it witnesses to those who are watching us and may not know Christ. And then Jesus concludes his teaching with this famous verse, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. What this sentence usually makes us think of is, you know, the close fellowship we experience in the church. Um, we know Jesus is here because we've got that warm, loving feeling towards one another within us. But notice Jesus says these words when he's talking about how to sort out our differences. He's not talking just about those warm, fuzzy times of agreement, but about the times when we have to deal with things that really put our faith and our fellowship to the test. Hurtful actions and difficult conversations, disputes, disagreements, and discords that are, will inevitably be part of our life together. We think Jesus is among us when we're feeling all wonderful and warm and peaceful and harmonious, but it's those times when we struggle to get along that we find out whether or not Jesus really is among us. So honesty, tenacity, community. This is Jesus' recipe for dealing with conflicts. And because he tells us, he not only tells us what we should do, but he also gives us what we need to do it, let us pray that we will have the grace to hear his, his words and put them into practice. Amen.